Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organization for the invitation to talk about access and benefit sharing and its relevance to Latin American countries. I am Manuela da Silva from Fundação Oswaldo Cruz. Currently, I am the general manager of the Fiocruz COVID-19 Biobank and the vice president of the World Federation for Cultural Collection. I will start talking about the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is a United Nations Treaty that was opened for signature on 5 June 1992. There are 196 countries that are part to the treaty, which entered into force in December 1993. The CBD has three main objectives. The conservation of biological diversity, the sustainable use of the components of the biodiversity, the fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising out of the utilization of genetic resources. And during this presentation, I will focus mainly in the third objective, the fair and equitable sharing of benefit sharing. So, the governing body of the CBD is the Conference of the Parties, the COP. To date, the Conference of the Parties has held 14 ordinary meetings, and since 2000, meet, these meetings have been held every two years. But we had, of course, a gap because of the pandemic. The last COP was in 2018, and uh, COP15 was supposed to happen in uh, China coming in 2020, but it was postponed and now it's going to happen in Montreal, Canada in December 2022. So the CBD established the concept of access and benefit sharing that is based on the third objective. And ABS, uh, as we call it, defines how genetic resource can be accessed and how the benefits resulting from their use are shared between users and providers. So in this framework, with these two figures, users and providers that can be people, institutions, or countries that use the resources, or people, institutions, or countries that provide them. The CBD covers everything that directly or indirectly refers to biodiversity, including other uh, more specific environmental conventions and agreements, such as the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur Supplementary Protocol on Liability and Redress to the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, and the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing that regulates the third objective of the, of the CBD. This is the Nagoya Protocol uh, that is an international agreement which aims at sharing the benefits arising from the utilization of genetic resources in a fair and equitable way. Uh, at the moment, we have 138 ratifications and accessions. And the Nagoya Protocol entered into force 12th of October of 2014 during the COP 12. So, normally the COP uh, happens in two weeks, so in the second week of the COP 12, it started the Nagoya Protocol COP 1, COP MOP 1, just after it entered into force. So, here we have the Nagoya, uh, the ABS uh, Clearinghouse, the Access and Benefit Sharing Clearinghouse, 
that it's a platform for exchange information access and benefit sharing established by Article 14 of the Nagoya Protocol. So this clearinghouse is a key tool for facilitating the implementation of Nagoya Protocol by enhancing legal certainty and transparency on procedures for access and benefit sharing and for monitoring the utilization of genetic resources along the value chain, including through the internationally recognized certificate of compliance. So here we can see the website of this ABS clearinghouse. <clears throat> In green are the countries that are party to Nagoya Protocol. Um, in this website, you can find information on the ABS, the national ABS legislation of these countries. So here, for example, if you don't find information enough, you can contact the competent national authority or the national focal point to try to, to get the information is missing or to, to try to clarify some points, etc. So uh, for us users, this platform is a very useful tool. Now I would like to talk a little bit about some international scientific organizations that have important initiatives related to the implementation of ABS legislation. I'm just referring to very few of them with the with which I am involved. So the World Federation for Culture Collections, uh, we have several uh, committees. Among them, we have the Access Policies and Legal Frameworks Committee. Currently, it's not uh, uh, yet active, but the idea is uh, to start soon. The Global Genome Biodiversity Network. In GGBN, we have several task forces, and one of them is the policies related to management and stewardship of genome genomic samples. We have also the Earth Biogenome Project, uh, which aims to sequence, catalog, and characterize the genomes of all Earth's eukaryotic biodiversity over a period of 10 years. And in this project, we have several committees, as we can see here, and one of them is the ethical, legal, and social issues. And there is another very important initiative that is the DSI Scientific Network. I will talk more about this network later on. So, now, talking about digital sequence information on genetic resources, which is currently a very hot topic in the CBD and Nagoya Protocol. Initially, the discussion on DSI started from the discussions on synthetic biology. Then DSI appeared as part of the discussions at the 13th meeting of the Conference of the Parties of the CBD in 2016, but decoupled from continued synthetic biology discussion. So this discussion continues, but now we have DSI separated from the synthetic biology discussions. So this started uh, the discussion on DSI in itself, started in 2016, COP13, then two years later, continued in the COP14 in Egypt in 2018. And now it's going to be addressed again in 2022 during the COP15. But between the, these two COPs, we had several meetings on DSI, specifically on DSI. So uh, in the end of the COP14 uh, in 2018, we had this uh, decision, the 14 slash 20, that 
decided that we needed four studies on DSI. One study on the concept and scope and current use of DSI. Another study on DSI in public and private databases. And another study on traceability. Then it was decided that it was needed to combine the two because they were completely related. And a fourth study, the fact-finding study on how domestic measures address beneficiary arising from commercial and non-commercial use of DSI and address the use of DSI for research and development. So based on study one, the scope of DSI, we have four groups. It's not yet defined, but we have been used these definitions. So, not officially, of course. So we have group one. Group one is DNA and RNA. Group two is group one plus proteins and plus epigenetic modifications. Group three is group two plus metabolites and other macromolecules. And we have a fourth group that includes information that is not related to molecular structure or information associated with their acquisition, and even included traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources. Here we have the combined study on DSI in public and private databases and traceability. These are the main authors of this study with the leadership of Amber Shaw's and here the contributing authors. Uh, I had the opportunity of being one of them. And in fact, uh, Amber brought this uh, opportunity of doing these uh, combined studies to GGBM, to our uh, executive committee. We discussed among the members of this committee the GGBM members, and we decided to work with Amber in this proposal, and then this was the result, this uh, combined study. Um, afterwards, just after that, some of these people started the DSI scientific network with, again, the leadership of Amber Schultz from the uh, German collection of microorganisms, the DSMZ. So this network started in 2020 with uh, a mission to contribute to policymakers and other stakeholders' understanding of TSI, its applications and contributions to research supporting biodiverse conservations and public health, as well as the global benefits of open access uh, uh, to DSI databases. So I invite you all to visit the website of DSI Scientific Network. You will find very useful information. You also will find this open letter. And please, if you haven't signed it yet, be my guest. Uh, the, this network has members from all, all over the world, including, of course, uh, representatives from Latin American countries. Currently, we have Brazil, Guatemala, Argentina, and Colombia uh, representing Latin America. This is a paper we uh, published in the beginning of this year a win-win multilateral option for DSI. So here we explain the, the option of multilateral mechanism for benefit sharing, and for that, the need of a global uh, benefit sharing fund. And also we explain the importance of open access to the sequence data in the uh, databases. So, in this paper, we explain why bilateral option won't work.
because of the amount of DSI data set, we have 228 million annotated sequences downloaded partially or completely 34 million times per year, used by more than 10 to 15 million unique users. 99.5% of the 750 downstream sequence databases that pull and push GSI through the scientific ecosystem directly rely on the INSDC system. DSI is linked to 1,200 interconnected databases and hundreds of thousands of DSI using publications cite 44 sequences per publication. So it's not possible to have bilateral agreements in these cases. That's one reason we need a multilateral mechanism. Another important observation coming back this issue of providers and users that I commented in the beginning of the presentation is that most of the countries or all of the countries are users and providers of GSI in the same time, as we can see through this graph that was made based on economic groups J77, OECD and BRICS. So here we can see that this space here is empty because no countries are only providing. And here is also empty because no countries are only using this DSI. And Brazil is a very good example of this. As we can see here, DSI from Brazil is being used by 108 countries. While researchers from Brazil are using DSI from 141 countries. So, regarding DSI, Brazil is more user than provider. We also bring in this paper DSI capacity problems most of our countries from Latin America face. High costs of molecular biology laboratory reagents and consumers. We also have problem with fun funding terms and conditions that prohibit technology transfer. We have a lot of problem because of brain drain. And of course, we have insufficient DSI infrastructure. For example, sequencing centers, IT infrastructure, bioinformatics. So, to finish my presentation, I bring here five principles of a win-win multilateral solution. Mm. We need open access. We need a decoupled approach. So, open access must be separated from benefit sharing. Simplicity. We need an option that is simple because science is already very complicated. Legal framework can't be. Harmonize. We need a solution that is compatible with other international treaties and with the physical genetic resource. Biodiversity. Any mechanism needs to effectively support biodiversity conservation, sustainable use, and green growth that are the global biodiverse framework goals. And then we will have a positive feedback loop. We have an option that we need an option that recognize sovereign rights and encourage lower and middle income countries participation, for example, through bonus payments. We need fairness and transparency, and this can be obtained through the DSI databases, providing data for DSI global biodiverse framework indicators 
that can be obtained by report on country of origin and indigenous people and local community origin, biological origin, so including plant, animal, pathogen, other microorganisms, fungi, capacity building and users by location. So this is uh, a scheme proposed in our paper where we explain our uh, multilateral option. So I invite you all to have a look in this paper. And with this, I finish my presentation. Uh, muito obrigada, muchas gracias, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.